Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Choral Conductors Colloquium, Volume 2, lection, Lecture 1. My name is Raul Dominguez, and I will be your host and moderator today. Before we begin, please note, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted in the near future on our YouTube channel, channel where you can also find our lectures from last summer, Volume 1. The University of Colorado Boulder is offering credit and certificates through their Department of Continuing Education for all those who attend all five lectures. Details on how to apply can be found in your colloquium e-blast. Your deadline to complete this process is September 1, and if you're with us today and have not received an e-blast, you will receive one in the near future. Today's lecture will be one hour long, followed by approximately a 15-minute question and answer session. Please submit your questions anytime uh, using the Q&A button found in your toolbar. Priority will be given to questions about today's topic. Questions submitted to the chat room will not be considered. Thank you to our sponsors, you, our viewers, as well as Dr. Gregory Gentry and the Choral Department at the University of Colorado Boulder. It is so great to see everyone. Thank you for supporting Volume 1 and welcome to Volume 2. And it is now my sincere privilege to welcome the Director of Choral Activities at Calvin University and the Chorus Director of the Grand Rapids Symphony, Dr. Pearl Shenquan. Hello, everybody. What a pleasure for me to be here and uh, very honored to be invited to present in this series. So um, the title of my topic is Leading with Body, Mind, Spirit, Voice, the Preparation of a Conductor. This presentation is a holistic approach to choral leadership of all ages, incorporating musical, pedagogical, spiritual, and physical preparation. I'm realizing that perhaps the audience represents a really wide range of teachers and conductors of different age groups and levels. Um, I hope that everybody gets something out of this presentation. We very often stop at musical preparation. And yet what we do and what we impart is so much more than that. I think everybody will agree that this year is certainly a year for the books. Um, where we have been more than teachers and conductors. We have been our own tech support, maybe. We have been uh, somebody's psychologist. We have been everyone's cheerleader. We have been um, caregivers and so many more roles. And so um, while we are looking forward to better times ahead, I think that we have learned a lot of lessons as well from this difficult year. Now, all along, I hope that you all have the lecture outline. I have put in some um, golden quotes, I say, which is the first one is, this is from Howard Swan. There are no bad choirs, only bad conductors. Now, that's a really hard pill to swallow, but so, so much truth in there. And so we begin to look at the role of the conductor. As teachers, we teach with effectiveness, is not just about what we teach, but how we teach. And, um, and toward the way that we teach so that our singers, especially if our choirs meet only once a week, can comprehend the quickest and also retain uh, the longest. We teach vocal techniques as part of rehearsal. Even if you're not from a vocal background, my, uh, I'm an instrumental by, uh, instrumentalist by training, earlier training, but took a lot of years of voice lessons as well. We need to be teaching vocal techniques at a rehearsal. We teach comprehensive musicianship, or what I call smart singing, so that our singers develop greater independence over the course of time. Um, we teach them analytical skills, even the most basic, A section, B section, A section, Coda and such things, we teach critical listening skills so that we all grow in musicianship, but also in humanity. Second point, motivators. We motivate our singers or our players to strive for quality and, and excellence in all things. We motivate them to perform with their entire being. Uh, for singers, not just the neck up, but the whole body and our soul. And we motivate 
recruitment of singers and community support. This is something that we don't ever, um, we can ever have the luxury of not thinking about. Leader, as a leader, we lead with acceptance of full responsibility. And that starts with us. At the end of every rehearsal, I jot down very quick notes, what went really good and what didn't go so well so that I myself can learn um, because I may not remember as well um, the next time. We lead the ensemble. Of course, the body of this presentation will be based on that, so much more later on. As leaders, we establish a safe, fair, nurturing, and responsible environment. We are also students. We study endlessly throughout life, including occasionally video recording ourselves of our own conducting and rehearsals. We tend to view ourselves through quite forgiving lenses, but I have found that doing this, which is uh, every conducting class that I teach for my own students, they're all recorded, but I do that for myself as well. Every so often, I just put the uh, recorder on and videotape myself and look at myself because videos don't lie. Just last semester, I was teaching this beginning conducting course and one of my students said, and I had warned them, I said, you know, it's not gonna be easy watching yourself conduct, but do it because you will learn so much more quickly. And he came to the next class and said, you know, Dr. Shankwan, I watched my, you know, 10 minute video and down a whole gallon of ice cream after that. It was that hard to watch. And I said, good for you. You can afford to eat that gallon of ice cream. Now, as students, we also read with broad interest, not just about music. And this is what I learned from my own teacher, Dr. Flummerfeld. We read a wide range of books about other aspects of life so that we develop deeper understanding and empathy. Um, I enjoy reading leadership articles and sometimes even business leadership articles because how we run our choirs have some parallels in there or about other types of music that may not be your own cup of tea. The title uh, for this topic came from Mama Helen Kemp, who I had the wonderful pleasure of studying working with children's choir. Mama Helen Kemp was quite the leader of the children's choral movement in the church. And she would teach us body, mind, spirit, voice. It takes the whole person to sing and rejoice. So this is, um, I just thought, well, you know, this is not only does it take the whole person to sing and rejoice, it also takes the whole person to teach our singers. So let's stop on the first point of mind. If you will follow along in your outline, programming. What do we feed our singers and audience? Do we feed them a balanced diet? Maybe this is the mom and me talking but do we feed them a balanced diet that has both unity and variety, a balance of geography, chronology, and styles? Perhaps you have been in concerts, I know I have been in concerts, where it was performed beautifully, but somehow felt a little less satisfying. And I think at the end, you think about it, it's about the programming. You know, in real estate, the mantra is location, location, location. I think for us, it is programming, programming, programming. So, and um, once you, we have uh, settled on a program, as you know how hard it is, there's so many more. I've got all different stacks of maybes, uh, the no's, the maybes, and then the yes and different categories of yes and which program. After we've decided on our program, then the score study comes in. Um, how do we study the score so that bring, we can bring that score to life through study, imagination, and pedagogy? And we're constantly zooming in and out. And we're like insistent toddlers asking, what, where, why, how? And those never goes away. Those questions never go away. So um, let's go through what I call kind of like my pilot's checklist. So preliminary study, we assess the quality. Is it well-written? Is it singable in all parts? Do you have the singers for those parts? The appropriateness, is it suitable for the occasion? 
Um, are there problematic texts or are there um, other things that you would like to teach them about the text? Um, questions of practicality. Is there a reasonable time to learn? So as the chorus director of a, a symphonic choir, there are only a certain number of rehearsals I can do to prepare these large masterworks. But even in other contexts, I'm always having to be very careful. Is there a reasonable time to learn? And especially living in snow country, where I always have to plug in months of um, January, February, March. What if rehearsals get canceled? That's, that's not if, it's more like a when. Um, and so you have to think about, are, is there enough time to learn that? Can it be done with missing singers? Oh boy, did I learn this one this year. As my singers, we were in person at the university. As my singers rotated in and out of quarantine in every production was like planning, not just A to C, but A to Z and hoping that there are no more letters in the alphabet after Z. Um, are there additional instruments and how much is it gonna cost to bring in those instruments? Number two, interpretive study informed by background. Of course, we know looking at the composers, the times, the performance practice of the time and the place and the style. So if we were doing a piece from the Renaissance era, it would be very different than if we were doing, say, a piece uh, that's traditional South African music. So each piece for me from each era has a different costume is how I think of it and how I teach my singers to think of it. And about the context of that piece, is there a good marriage between the music and the text? Where is the text from? If it's a straight sacred course, a sacred source or uh, any kind of poem and about its context. How about the pronunciation? The spoken versus the sung diction. The flow, reading the text away from the music and then adding the rhythm. Music and its relationship to the text. So starting with large scale and looking at how sections relate to each other, how these are unified and constructed independently, which sections build energy and which relaxes, and how can these come alive in different sounds. And from here, from this large scale study, we look similar questions for smaller structures, phrases, words. So it's a little bit like an Ikea chair that you take it out of the box, you take all the parts out, you put them all together. How do you disassemble it? How do you unpack it for your singers so that it makes sense that when the entire chair is put together, kaboom, there is the chair and say, oh, that's right. It was built with all of these steps together. And never forget the insistent toddler through all of this to be asking what, where, why, and how. We look for changes, what I call choral CSI, you know, like a crime scene investigation, you kind of crack it open and you start looking for, hmm, okay, what's under the skin? What are the elements to look for? Harmony, changes in harmony, um, melody, how is the melody constructed? Rhythm, texture, the duration, intensity, dynamics, articulation, text, rubato, instrumentation. Now, even in a very simple anthem for a younger group, a lot of these elements are already present and you want to be looking there, not that you have to explain everything to young singers, but giving them some of that and helping to inform your own study will go toward a much more satisfying learning and teaching experience. And from there, you make interpretive decisions about tone. So what color, what timbre best fit this particular piece? Articulation. Articulation is not optional. I tell my singers that they're not like a piece of earring or necklace that you can put away, but that it's part and parcel of your skin. It comes in this how you bow it. The tempo. So it is so key that we 
settle on the tempo, um, looking at the composer's guideline, but also what works really well to bring it to life for our singers. That's not going to absolutely kill them if it's too fast or too slow. When I conduct large masterworks, the day of the performance, uh, the metronome is a special friend of mine because I know that once the nerves kick in or depending, perhaps I eat something a little spicy and then I'm like on the run, I wanna think, okay, what tempos as each movement or each portion shifts that I am keeping it to that tempo. I have done um, quite a number of projects with living composers and it can be very scary when you're sitting a few feet behind you and you're conducting and I know they feel it. And in one particular festival that I did, I knew um, at the rehearsal, I, I was taking this particular section a little slower and the composer had said, you know, Pearl, um, that one could be just a hair faster. So I walked around that day and I kept clicking quarter to 84, quarter to 84 and not at 80 that I was doing it at rehearsal. And right before I got to that section, I thought, okay, I better find where that 84 is right now so that he won't jump out at me. It's like, Pearl, didn't I tell you? But anyway, that's just a little story about how it is so important for us to have that tempo settled. So when the nerves kick in and we're on stage, that it is a tempo that we have been practicing. <clears throat> all notes are not created equal. Because if you sing all notes created equal, it'll sound like um, we're hitting with a hammer, especially if it's very homophonic music, okay? Or a melismatic portion can sound like we're typing on a keyboard da, 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 without any kind of shape. And so how do we shape that phrase? Melismatic phrases is based on what's happening in the text and what's happening in the music. How I tend to think of it is this excerpt of a quote by the late Robert Shaw as every note departing from, passing through, and arriving at. Okay? Every note departing from, passing through, and arriving at. That has helped me to think about, okay, how do I shape this longer phrases and perhaps shorter phrases within the longer phrase? <clears throat> Onward with our pilot's checklist, pedagogical study, the what and how. Often, it is just what we do. We look at the what, but we also, what and how, but I suggest that we also look at the when and why and to share this with our singers so that we increase their independence, which affects their engagement with the music and also with the audience. Of course, depending on what age group, what levels you work with, how much information they can absorb. But even with working with young children, you can also know that sharing some of the when and the why will help them understand so much better. We locate potential problem spots for performers. And one of the guidelines is if you're reading through it and you trip, you can bet that your own singers will most likely trip over that as well. And then you're thinking, okay, what can I do to avoid that? Okay. Um, we determine effective ways to teach toward good retention using kinesthetics. So um, kinesthetics in a way that we have them express in rehearsal on the outside, what needs to be happening on the inside. This is what I jokingly call to prevent choral amnesia, especially for choirs that meet once a year. I had a church choir for about 10 years to, in working in different churches. And um, every Wednesday when I met them, sometimes I would see expressions that think, hmm, I'm looking at that music the first time and I'm like talking to myself. Nope, that's not the first time. I am very nervous when I see those eyebrows meeting together. So how can I work? How can I put in some techniques that will help them to remember? So I tend to use more actions in my rehearsals, even when I'm working with my university kids. So pushing sideways as we sing through a phrase and they go, whoa, 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 one breath. And then when you start another phrase and you start pushing, 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 pushing sideways again. Or we clap for open breaths. For example, if the breath 
if it the music begins with a rest something okay so that we clap so we're all clapping together makes us breathe together in that spot um tapping smaller note values as you sing larger note values or we tap our neighbors on the rests um, I always tell them to be very careful because you want to use this technique judiciously if you don't want to lose control of your rehearsals. But I find this technique very effective because where you need to rest, the tapper is much more conscious because he or she or they will, do not want to make mistakes. And then the person being tapped perhaps might need that little reminder. Or you can tap smaller note values um, or tapping, um, isolating the difficult spots. I would write maybe a bar's worth on the board and then we tap it. And we use that actually as part of our warm-up, so that they're thinking about that even before we add all the different layers. And then I incorporate, so this is a warm-up. So my warm-ups will have rhythmic warm-ups, melodic warm-ups, and all kinds of different warm-ups. That is, um, that has a goal of what I call preemptive strike. So that warm up might be five to seven minutes in a 15 minute rehearsal, but I'm already laying the groundwork for what is to come next. So it's not just a vocal warm up, but very much of body, mind, spirit, voice. We develop overall rehearsal strategy and effective tactics. And not just relying on repetition, of course there's a place for repetition, but it should not be the only way that we teach how to take a piece apart and then put it back together. And you can only do it if you've really analyzed the music. And then we develop strategies on how for singers to best retain from rehearsal to the next rehearsal. Now that's a whole totally different um, topic that I can talk about at a different time. I like to use a lot of imagery from real life because we can understand very quickly and it really covers a wider range of experience. Number four, listening with our inner ears. Can you hear the score while looking at it? So I was a very young mom and um, with my first grad degree, I had um, a nine month old baby. And so I did not have the luxury of being in the library. And to this day, I still do that because I still have a special needs child at home. And so I can only study score really away from the piano because I don't want to wake the kids up. And so over the years, I've developed that skill that came out of necessity, but learning scores away from a keyboard instrument and looking at it. Um, listen and compare different recordings but don't get locked into one. Teach and insist that your choir members listen to each other because this can solve a lot of problems. So they may think they are the ones doing all the singing. And of course we're paid the big bucks to do the listening, but it could, things could be so much better if our choir members, all of them, and I would say no matter how young they are, could be taught to listen and to listen critically. Um, the combination of analysis, historical understanding, and intuition honed by experience and study. Of course, this accumulates with experience, but this is the goal that we work toward. Foresight instructs pedagogy. Pedagogy helps when a challenge arises, but foresight through study tells us challenge is coming. Foresight helps us to develop plan B or CDE before any of that is needed. So now let's go to body, okay? Now I must say, I should have said earlier that I kind of shifted the four components, body, mind, spirit, voice, a little bit differently. So now let's go to body, gestures and meaning. When we conduct, especially if you work with less experienced choirs, we still need to conduct the music, not how to sing it. Of course, at the initial learning stages, we have to use more what I call teaching gestures. But I have found that occasionally when I am invited to work with children's choir, 
that they can understand that. I will say I don't want to do certain things or I will minimize those. And I will minimize those because I know you know how to do it and it needs to be happening on the inside. I would love to conduct the music. And sometimes even with my own university choirs, I would say, you know what? I want to conduct the music. I don't want to be conducting fixing things along the way. I can conduct a whole minute of consonants for you or this and that. But no, that comes in the teaching stage. And as we walk toward the performance, we move toward performance gestures. And sometimes I show them exactly what they will see. Find the conducting challenges for yourself and solve those. Making decisions, practicing, sometimes coming off certain things, perhaps for Mata, I will show them, okay, let me narrow it down to two different ways that I would do it. I show it to them, A or B, and let them choose what is clear to them. And if they choose whatever, A or B, then you must stick with it because it could cause a little train wreck. These, these are especially on the transition spots. Now, having said that, um, as the chorus master, um, I have to work with a variety of conductors, especially guest conductors. So I would put my conducting teacher's hat on. And one time I remember preparing, um, I think it was the Mozart C minor mass for a conductor. And I thought, okay, coming off this fermata, there are four ways of doing it. So I trained my chorus and I said, okay, here's one, two, three, four. So you might see some of these. And we have two rehearsals with the orchestra. So one rehearsal and one dress rehearsal and two performances. And each night coming to that spot, the conductor use one of each of them. So if you are in that uh, role as a preparer to be thinking along those ways as well. I also use, um, have my singers um, conduct sometimes. So can I, they feel one, two, three, one, two. It's not a massive conducting lesson, but helping them feel in their gestures. Can they do crescendo, decrescendo? So that if they see me do that during the performance, they can immediately respond to it because they know what it feels like. So using those judiciously so that my rehearsal does not become a conducting class, but using some of them so that they can feel the music. Now, if you work with adults and sometimes they were like, well, I don't wanna do it. I just kind of humor them, I badger them until they do it because when everybody does it, then it is a very different picture. Working with instrumental ensemble or orchestras, very few rehearsals, right? At most one. I have prepared, I have conducted um, large works and more often than not, I get all of one rehearsal. Ahead of that, you have to decide and practice transitions. Those are the trickiest ones. I start with what 10 spots must I get through if I have that one rehearsal, okay? So that it doesn't fall apart during the performance. I become a little bit more beat oriented when I am standing in front of an orchestra, but I try to keep my right hand from yelling. You understand what I mean? So one, two, three, four, okay? That's not needed. It's more beat oriented, but you can still conduct the music. Don't ignore the orchestra when you're with, um, when you've put two groups together, okay? I actually often tell my choirs, I am gonna leave you. I'm not gonna look at you. When I have the orchestra in front of me at rehearsal, you guys are so used to me. They get one shot of me, okay? Do not feel bad. I am gonna deliberately ignore you. And perhaps the rehearsal before that rehearsal, there would come those spots when I would actually conduct and deliberately not look at them and look at my side to get them used to that, oh, she's not gonna be feeding us every single thing when we've got two groups together. Physical health. How do you yourself maintain physical health so that we will have that stamina? How do we encourage our singers to develop better physical health? How do we present ourselves on stage? What is our poise like? I actually practice these with my singers. So when we walk on stage, when we exit the stage, 
as we're waiting on stage, it is part and parcel of the performance. When we walk on stage, do we want people to think, oh, I bet this is going to be a really good choir. And hopefully that is um, you know, confirmed by the performance and that we walk in, it is a welcoming presence and a nice mix of both confidence and also a welcoming spirit. Let's go to voice. Tone, healthy tone, supportive tone, resonant tone. And here I quote my own teacher, Dr. Joseph Lummerfeld, we search for the sound which grows out of the particular work being sung. I love varied programs because I love to eat varied kinds of food. I try to think if I have programmed a very, very program, that it needs to feel like a different choir has just walked in for that Renaissance piece. A different choir has walked in if this piece came from a different continent in modern times or a different choir. So if it's a program of six pieces or so, it needs to feel like six different choirs have just sung that program. Because if you use exactly the same tone for the whole program, it becomes kind of bland after a while. So that's, we have the foundation, obviously good choral tone, and then we've got different palette, colors in the palette. Um, and we begin building this from the first read of the music. Okay? Um, so that if this is a tone that you're working toward, that what you do from the get-go has to build that foundation, obviously compatible with age and inherent abilities. Is this piece an ooh-bass sound, or is it an e-bass sound, or an ah, or an o, oh, or perhaps different sections call for different sounds? Different styles of music must sound differently. I like to say that Sushi must not taste like hamburger, or it won't be like sushi, okay? So here again is the mom in me talking about different kinds of foods have to have different flavors. The same way too with our programming. Intonation. I always tell my singers, we must tune like good, underline good string players, whether we are singing an accompanied piece or an acapella piece. So I sneak in chromatic scales at almost every single one of my rehearsals. And they can start with just one going up to a um, you know, major third or minor third, perfect fifth, and working all the way up to an octave and so forth. There are so many variations that you can do. Or you can have one part hold the tonic and then the other part move, coming back down to me and such. But it's so important that they are hearing the smaller half steps and not just whole step or the five note pattern warm up. Blend. Um, I actually don't even use the word blend in my rehearsals. I talk about unified sound, unified vowels, because sometimes I have found that using blend will come out kind of bland. It'll be just kind of this somewhere in the middle of the road, kind of a tone. Whereas I'm really interested in what is the best tone color for this particular piece. Again, quoting Robert Shaw, the blend or the unified sound is the result of right pitch at the right time on the right dynamic level with the right vowel. That's a tall order, but something I know that we can all strive toward and be successful with. Other qualities, is it a heavier tone? Is it a lighter tone? Um, is it a darker color, um, different eras, um, different brightness of sound? So if I were singing, um, let's say an English cathedral piece, do my sopranos sound like 12 year old English choir boys or at least to aim toward that? Or with my younger singers, when I want a much more robust, fuller tone for a certain um, music, I would think you need to be, I would tell them, okay, you need to be at least a 35-year-old opera singer and such. So using imagery for them to, oh yeah, okay, now I know what kind of that looks like and what that can sound like. 
finally to spirit. Okay. Um, I, uh, Paul Solomonovich, many, many years, um, LA Master Corral, I quote him here. He says, I want to see the meaning of the text in their faces and hear it in their voices. This is so important for me. One can sing beautiful music. One can sing it beautifully. I've attended a lot of concerts where the, the level of music making is so high. But the expression is how I would call the expression of a stormtrooper. How do we engage as you know, the audience with um, the listeners? And we hear it in our voices. Do we hear, when I hear something, can I, can I hear the meaning, the understanding of the text in their voices? Can I see it in their facial expression? Here's another quote from Ramona Wiss. Who we are always comes out in what we do. So how developing ourselves, our humanity, is such an important part of our leadership because the words that we use matter. Words matter. Words have consequences. And when we lead, we can be direct without being insulting. We can help them to strive toward a higher quality without belittling others. Words matter. Balancing the process with the product, both for short and long-term growth. So at every rehearsal, I'm thinking, okay, I know I'm preparing for this particular um, performance, but what skills, what long-term skills am I developing in the meantime? And it's that steady growth. So I would love that the singers who had me in September, by the time we came to May, would have grown um, in their independence, in their appreciation, in their understanding, and in every single way as a choral singer. It's balancing that process with the product. It is understandable. We get very focused on the product because that is our public product. But that process is equally, if not even more important, because that's, those are the seeds that we plant in our singers' lives. Of course, they remember wonderful performances, but getting there, too, is part of that journey. Silence and solitude. We deal with music. We deal with sounds. But music is punctuated by rests. Silence makes the music more meaningful. Now, today's default position, this is not solitude. It actually could be quite a cacophony because of what we're reading and what's coming in. It may not be making audible sounds, but the sounds that are going inside of us. How do you, as a conductor and teacher, balance silence and sounds in your own life. I'm very particular about that, perhaps because I very much am an introvert. And so I, I know how much I have in me, how much gasoline I can spend before I start running on empty. But to think and feel deeper things, we must make space for it. So whether I'm walking around, um, preferably not in a shopping mall because my eyes get distracted, but if I find a good spot to walk by the lake or in a garden or something, the earworms start. And it's during those moments that I think, oh, the deeper meaning of that phrase, the deep, deeper meaning of that quote or that poem. Programming for the spirit. I think we all agree that this has been a difficult year for every one of us. As I was programming for this past school year, I thought I have to be very intentional that what I program this year, as my students continue on in their life journey, 
when they need hard times, that these songs that we sang this year will bubble up in their spirit and will be a source of strength and courage for them. Now more than ever, in a time of such deep division in our own country, and in a time of global crisis, how can we celebrate? How can we understand and celebrate each other better? How can we unite better as a people? Back to the first thing about programming. What do we feed our singers? It doesn't have to be music that is exceptionally difficult, that of course it shows our technical strength, you know, in whatever context you are in. But I would really encourage you, even at this time, as we look ahead to easier times, we have to acknowledge that this has been a difficult stretch. We have grown. We have had such great sense of losses. And how can we harness that? And how can we feed on the music that we have been learning and teaching this year so that when hard times come again in the future, that it will be a reminder, it will be a balm for our soul. If you work in the context of the church, this is my own quote for you. We sing God's word into our hearts and minds to take root and bear fruit in our lives. What we do as choral conductors is a great calling. It is a great vocation. I don't think any one of us came to do this for the money, right? What has kept us together during this time? What has kept us sane during this time? Think of the, dif the different art forms that has kept us sane. Think of if we didn't have that, I think that we all have renewed appreciation for what we do, right? When I first my, met my choir in September last year, this is after six months, you know, we were as most of our choirs were, we were dispersed in March, thinking we would come back in a couple of weeks or maybe a month. And all through summer, wondering if we were gonna come back or not. In my university, we actually came back for in-person learning. So at my first rehearsal with my university SATB choir, we got through the warm-up, and I said, let's pause and click save. Just sit. What did it feel like? Six months of not doing it. And the tears started. And I said, remember, remember this moment. Because in the past, hey, choral singing, we can always get together, right? And why do I have to go to that rehearsal and all of that? But when it was taken away, we have now come back with such renewed appreciation. And if you've not had the opportunity to do in-person rehearsal, look toward that day and be encouraged that we are going toward it. You know, choral art gives us ways to express great joy, great deep sorrows, but also to celebrate the human spirit and to work toward greater understanding and unity. It is such a beautiful art, isn't it? I would like to just wrap up with reading you a very short poem. This is by an anonymous author. And I first, um, and set beautifully by my friend and, um, and friends, many of us, I'm sure, Andrea Ramsey. She wrote this piece for the Southwest ACDA um, conference, I think several years ago, and invited me to conduct that. And this is a piece that has stayed in my spirit because it beautifully captures what we do. So the title is The Soul's Own Speech. For the common things of every day, God gave a speech in a common way. For the deeper things we feel, we think and feel, God gave the poet words to reveal. 
for the heights and depths that know no reach. God gave us music, the soul's own speech. So it takes, we are, we have such a beautiful privilege and responsibility to do what we do. And we give so much of it because we, as choral conductors, are givers by nature. And we come at it to prepare in all the different ways with our minds, with our bodies, with our voice and our spirit. I encourage you to care for yourself as we care for our singers, but to always treasure, I think now more than ever, to have that renewed appreciation for this beautiful art that we have the privilege of learning, of sharing, of imparting, and planting those seeds in the lives of our singers so that it will bear fruit for them. Thank you so much for your kind attention. And um, I turn it over back now to Rose. Thank you, Dr. Shankwan, for your insight and, and wonderful stories. Very, very moving. Thank you. We'll now transition into the Q&A session. Please remember to submit your questions using the Q&A button. Priority will be given to questions about today's topic. And our first question comes from Michelle, who writes, you mentioned that uh, the importance of being a scholar today. Are there, are there books for study that you would recommend? And thank you for your lecture. Okay, I was wondering if we can elaborate um, scholars on certain what what aspects I can start with some general things. So, um, you know, do you have any? Okay, sorry. All right, I'm sorry, I got distracted with the question. All good, all good. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I, you know, I am a nerd. I'm a book nerd. I just love to read and I'm quite curious. So I look at obviously if you're if I am doing, um, let's say, B minor mass, okay, preparing for that. I look at, um, you know, John Elliott Gardner's uh, music. Um, what, what is it in the castle of heaven? Or, um, and then from there, I actually look at the bibliography. And then from there, you look at, okay, where, where these articles lead. And so that I kind of put my researchers hat on. So depending on different eras, um, Dennis Schrock's books are, um, you know, go-to or survey of choral music. There's just a ton of good materials out there. I look at the GIA, um, Walton catalog, um, Oxford catalog in particular. So it depends if I am preparing for those kinds of masterworks. If I'm preparing for global music, I look at um, Andre, the Quadros book, I think it's published by um, Cambridge. And, and so those kind of lead the way, or I just start with um, Google and then they lead me all along. If I'm looking for pedagogical things, then I look for those um, avenues as well, those outlets, um, the reputable publishers. Um, and I just kind of look at them and kind of synthesize them so that when I'm sharing with my singers, it's something depending on their age group and their levels that they can understand. But so it, because of my work that runs such a wide range of repertoire, um, you know, I can go from, okay, the, if, if I am guest conducting, um, you know, all states and so forth, um, fine, you know, that that's, that's a great way. And I, I can think of, um, you know, just your basic new growth and all of that from new growth, just lead and you start researching all the way to, you know, heavy duty classical work. Um, you know, I've prepared the Mahler symphonies, for example, and then you start getting into the really nerdy things. But I hope that answers your question. I know it's just a very general answer. Great. Thank you. And, and Michelle confirms that you answered her, her question. Great, great. Um, just to confirm, everyone, um, there are some questions in the chat, but if you'll put them in the Q&A, that way I can keep track of them easier. Our next question comes from John. Do you have any tips on building culture, the, the culture of your ensemble? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, some. So I start, I have a, a, currently my day job, I have a women's choir, which I founded. And I founded it because I thought, you know what, I don't want um, any of a women's choir to feel like they're rejects of the SATB concert choir. So I have a treble um, concert choir, an SATB concert choir. And then I've got a um, town and gown. And then um, my job with the symphony, of course, is a symphonic choir, about 140. Um, I 
without preaching at them, I would kind of use the, the language that I used in trying to build respect for each other. One of the things I use is like a bouquet of flowers. There are different kinds of flowers in there. We are not all the same. We're very different. Or a piece of music. All of us are different. We are. Some might be a sportsando. Oh, you know the sportsando in your choirs, right? Some might be mezzo piano. Some might, might be the forte and whatnot. But if we, um, we appreciate everyone in here so that we can make music together, a culture of respect. And I'm well aware that uh, sometimes, you know, um, students can get a little, you know, catty and there's like backbiting. And I say, you know, I tell them, check that at the door. Um, we are here. This is a space that we are going to create beauty. And so those things have no place in a place. Those kinds of um, nasty behaviors.